Hello, my name is Ryan Harp, and this is going to be the week seven assignment for FTE 211. In this week's assignment, uh, it's going to be a bit of a long one. So we're going to analyze when trigger work should, be, should and shouldn't be performed. We'll discuss the improper trigger work and uh, problems and how to avoid them. We'll demonstrate analyzing um, how we're going to. We'll demonstrate how we're going to analyze the trigger fitment. Uh, we'll talk about some specific components, angle, surfaces, um, tensions, and dimensions that can and cannot be altered. We'll talk about some aftermarket jigs that uh, you can use for trigger work. Um, next, we're going to go ahead and after all that, we'll smooth the trigger track um, and we'll smooth the uh, trigger bar as well. Uh, after we get done with that, we'll conduct a dry and dummy function check just to ensure that everything still works perfectly. Uh, and then to cap off the video, we'll talk about some alterations that I plan to make on this firearm. So first and foremost though, uh, we wanna make sure that there's no ammunition in the work area. Next thing, we need to check the safety of our weapon. So we've already got the feed source removed. Um, so we're gonna verify that the chamber is free and clear. Look again, good. Let the hammer go forward and we're all right so for step one in this assignment we're going to uh, analyze when trigger work should and shouldn't be performed so everything about the 1911 is all about fitment uh, making it as tight and precise as possible and the same thing goes where we have these hammer and sear interaction so with the number one type of trigger work that we'll perform on the 1911 will be um, matching the sear and the hammer's angle up together that's going to be when we need to evaluate if certain trigger work should be performed so when we're taking the hammer and the sear out, we're feeling for that interaction, we're testing the trigger pull. If we've got something that's in excess of four pounds, then we can really work on that trigger and lighten it up. Um, we really don't wanna take it any less than four pounds. So unless it's a competition gun or something like that, if we're taking it below four pounds, it should be for a competition weapon. You don't want that for a duty or a concealed carry weapon. So the other time that we'll perform trigger work and work on the fire control group is when we have a rough or a gritty trigger um, that skips along the tracks. We can polish some surfaces, really clean that up and, and smooth it out and just give it a better fitment. Again, if we have a light trigger, we shouldn't be performing work on the, on the hammer and the sear. Um, and if the trigger is already very smooth, very crisp, if the user likes the trigger, trigger work should also be avoided. <clears throat> that rolls right into the next subject, which is improper trigger work. So with the trigger, there are certain angles, certain um, tolerances that we must stay in. So when we're talking about the hammer and the sear interaction, we, we should have about 200, uh, 200 tenths, 20, uh, sorry, we should have about a tolerance of two hundredths, I believe it is, uh, between our sear and our hammer, our hammer hooks. So with the uh, two hundredths of an inch, I believe it is, um, should be our hammer hooks. And we don't want to go any less than that. And we also want to keep it at a 90 degree angle. If we start to uh, expand that angle past 90 degrees, the sear can slip from the hammer. Um, if we go any shorter than that if we, we have less distance than that we can also start to see issues uh, with the with the sear slipping and end up with a runaway gun so to avoid that we want to make sure we're taking appropriate measurements and we're staying with it in those specifications so the next step is going to be tearing down the gun um, and then we'll go over analyzing uh, the fire control group and it's all right so on to what is going to be step five which is after talking about the dimensions that can be altered, such as the sear, the hammer hooks. Um, next thing is to talk about sear jigs to help perform trigger work. So this is the jig that I have here. This is the uh, Marvel Brownell sear jig. Um, if you look at my video from last week, you can see me using it to alter the surface of the sear. Uh, to be quite frank about it, I hate it. Um, so this little nut is supposed to hold the sear locked into place, and it doesn't. It doesn't work. Um, it doesn't hold the sear where you need it to be. Uh, there's a bunch of internet forums with guys talking about the modifications they made to a jig to make it work. Um, the whole purpose of buying a jig is so it works. So this is one of the jigs. Um, if you're going to get a jig for sear work, I'd recommend getting the Ed Brown jig. It's very simple. It comes with the appropriate spacer. The one thing this does have is a jig so you can hook the hammer up in here. And you can set the hammer hooks up. And I don't know if it'll let me do it with the bar on here. So... So it's designed so you can set the hammer hooks up right at the appropriate 90 degree angle. So 
So once you tighten this uh, with the Allen wrench, grab it right here. It really does hold. So then you just place it in slot A of the jig. I'm sorry, slot B of the jig. You get it set to its 90 degree angle. Then you use this screw on the bottom to rise it up. And you can use this right here. Uh, you're supposed to be able to use this to back your file. So you can file along and maintain that 90 degree angle on here. Again, that's not something you really need to jig for. Um, I bought it because it alleged that you can perfectly cut both angles of the sear, um, but it turned out to be very misleading. Waste of money, waste of hundred and some odd dollars. Uh, just get yourself the Ed Brown jig, works much better. But this is one. All right, so for part three of the video, uh, we're going to demonstrate how we analyze the sear uh, and hammer relationship. So what we want to do is make sure that we have a good locking surface, not only in our hammer lugs, but our half cock and our full cock. So, so we want to verify that we've got that good surface contact, a clean, crisp break, and we want to be able to analyze and this you're going to need magnification for in order to see truly that you can fully, uh, if I can get it in focus, analyze the relationship between them with magnification, but just by setting it up uh, right in, right into the uh, hammer and sear holes, you can set it up on the outside of the frame and analyze the fitment of the components. All right, so we're back with our uh, second to last portion of this assignment, which is going to be our dry and our dummy functions check. So what we want to do, uh, we've got a magazine only loaded with dummy rounds, nothing in the weapon. So again, weapon's free and clear of ammunition. Good. Gonna let the slide go forward. Gonna test the safeties first. So grip safety is not depressed, pulling the trigger, nothing happens. Thumb safety, grip safety depressed, pull the trigger, nothing happens. Safety removed, pull the trigger, hammer drops. Okay, hammer stays locked back, release the trigger, hammer still in place. So the next portion of our functions check is gonna be a dummy. So we've got it loaded with three dummy rounds. We're gonna test all the functions. So, all right, so first things first, slide, chamber to round. So pull the trigger, ejection, extraction's good. Release, trigger, ejection, extraction's good. Pull the trigger, ejection, extraction, and slide lock all work appropriately. All right, so for the final portion of this week's assignment, we're gonna talk modifications or alterations to the firearm. So the top three alterations that I want to make to the firearm uh, are going to be the grip safety, which right now we currently have the uh, government model grip safety on here. Um, the trigger, I hate the trigger on here, um, only because there's so much play and I can't adjust it. So I'd like to adjust the trigger travel. Uh, we've got anywhere from a 16th to a full eighth of an inch travel before we hit that wall. And then the other thing that I'd like to do on here is do some shaping of the grip as well as checkering on the front. So, so those are going to be the top three alterations I wish to make on this. So I did buy a new hammer and grip safety for this. Um, even though this is the government model and this is supposed to be a drop in grip safety, it doesn't fit. Um, it doesn't look good. There's too much of a gap and I want those close tolerances. So what I'm going to do is send this back to Wilson combat and I'm going to buy a different grip safety and I'm going to buy a kit or I'm sorry, not a kit, a jig to shape this beaver tail right here to allow it, uh, it to fit more appropriately. So I did make some alterations to it already. I don't know if you can tell from looking at it, but it is no longer Cerakoted green. So I stripped all the Cerakote off, uh, pressure, pressure washed it. Um, I used my blast cabinet back there, ripped all the uh, Cerakote off, and then decided to parkerize it. So I was trying to decide between parkerizing and a color case hardening. Um, it would have been a cold color case hardening though. So I chose to just go with the parkerized finish. Came out pretty good. There are some areas that are still Cerakote on here, but those are other modifications I plan to make, which include uh, on here, the magazine release, the trigger, the barrel. I don't plan to, uh, um, to replace the barrel. The gun's actually got a decent barrel, shoots pretty accurately, but I am thinking about uh, doing a nickel coating to the barrel instead um, and then the slide lock and the thumb safety so the slide lock and the thumb safety I plan on replacing with uh, extended versions of both just to make it a little easier that and then the grip screws I don't know you can see I've already replaced the grips on here um, 
I plan on replacing the grip screws, uh, so I chose not to parkerize them and spend time working on that.